Welcome to Chapter 23, Microbial Diseases of the Cardiovascular and Lymphatic Systems, Part 1. This chapter fulfills objective number 4, as usual. In Part 1, we're going to cover the structure and function of the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems and bacterial diseases up to bubonic plague. In Part 2, we're going to pick up Lyme disease, go on to viral diseases, protozoan diseases, and helminthic diseases. We've gone over the structure of the lymphatic system in the chapter on innate immunity. Just a reminder, when the fluid in the blood leaks out of the capillaries to bathe the cells in nutrients, we call it interstitial fluid, picks up waste products, and is returned to the cardiovascular system through the lymphatic system. And this is a spot where your immune system can filter the lymph looking for antigens. Well, in these filters, some pathogens can live and proliferate and cause disease. So we're going to be looking in this chapter at organisms that can infect the heart, infect the blood, and also infect the lymphatic system and its associated immune organs. Under the category of bacterial diseases, we're going to discuss sepsis, infections of the heart, anthrax, gangrene, cat scratch disease, bubonic plague, Lyme disease, and epidemic typhus. In a perfect world, there are no bacteria in the bloodstream or in the lymphatic system, but we're constantly being exposed to bacteria and other pathogens within the bloodstream especially in today's modern world where we're receiving injections, uh, catheters are being inserted, surgery is being conducted, and normally your immune system takes care of this. Now there are situations where bacteria does get into the blood and replicate there, and we call this septicemia. That's where you have a pathogen living and reproducing in the blood. Now when we have bacteria or some other pathogen living in the lymphatic systems and causing inflammation. Now we usually call this blood poisoning because it looks like it's following a blood vessel, but it's actually following a lymphatic vessel and we call this lymphangitis okay, or inflammation of a lymphatic vessel. Now let's talk about sepsis is where you have inflammation mediators in the blood, but they're being released by a pathogen that's growing in just one spot. And it's causing an immune response throughout the entire circulatory system because of these immune mediators that are being released into the blood system. That's sepsis. Most causes of sepsis are gram positive. In the previous chapter, we talked about Staph aureus. Staph epi can also cause sepsis. They're growing in one spot, but they're releasing immune mediators and causing inflammation within the blood system. Uh, that's the most common kind because, like I said, in modern world, we're having needles injected, we're having surgery done, I cut myself while I'm working on a project, and skin bacteria get into the tissues causing sepsis. Generally, you know, we can treat this with antibiotics and, and it's not too terribly bad unless it gets out of control. Gram-negative sepsis, on the other hand, because of the superantigen of the LPS, can cause a more serious disease that goes into septic shock. Now, we've talked about this several times. Make sure you remember it. We also treat this with antibiotics, but we take care to m make sure that we don't cause septic shock in the process of treating the disease. Infections can arise in the heart itself, mainly in the endocardium, which is the inner lining of the heart, covers the heart muscles, also covers the valves. Bacteria can get to the heart from numer numerous sources. When you have dental work done, 
even if you're not flossing and you get a little bit of gingivitis or if you have a piercing or any way that you can get bacteria from where it normally is on your skin in your mouth into the bloodstream it can get to the heart and cause an infection. Now for most of us your immune system clears out these bacteria and it's not a problem but you can develop subacute endocarditis that's where you have inflammation of the endocardium that develops slowly and this usually happens in people that have a defect of the the heart valves generally like a murmur or something like that because there's a problem it causes a place for the bacteria to settle colonize and cause disease we also have acute endocarditis and this can happen quickly if you happen to get staph aureus into your system staph aureus is one of our worst uh, opportunistic pathogens most people are carriers of it gets into your bloodstream and it can grab a hold of your endocardium or your heart valves and cause disease even if you don't have a defect and this causes rapid development of symptoms now symptoms of endocarditis whether it's subacute or acute are impairment of heart function and also clots can develop and break off and block blood vessels and lodge in major organs. Now this can lead to death if it's not treated with appropriate antibiotics. Now another infection that can affect the heart is rheumatic fever. Let's talk about the progression of rheumatic fever. Most of us when we get strep throat, pharyngitis of the throat, um, it's short term. You get a sore throat, most of us go get antibiotics and it takes care of itself. Sometimes the causative agent of strep throat, which is Streptococcus pyogenes most of the time, can get into the bloodstream and cause rheumatic fever. And one of the most common symptoms of rheumatic fever are these nodules that develop at the elbow here we've got the elbow joint and this causes temporary arthritis now for some people there is also an autoimmune response against the heart valves during rheumatic fever and you have heart symptoms during the time that you have this temporary rheumatic arthritis that's why we call it rheumatic fever you also have a fever of course um, associated with this infection what we think is happening there is an antigen on the surface of streptococcus genus bacteria that's called the M protein and for some people some of their heart proteins look an awful lot like that M protein and so we think your immune system after fighting the strep infection get confused and attack your heart now once the strep is cleared out of the system the immune system backs off and stops attacking the heart valves but when you're reinfected the heart valves are re-attacked and this can lead to damage of the valves leading to heart murmurs and other problems um, such as enlarged hearts if it's not treated like in the days before we had antibiotics this led to fatal consequences. Nowadays we have uh, fewer people dying from rheumatic fever because we're able to treat strep infections and decrease their duration. For many years anthrax was an animal disease. It's caused by a gram-positive bacillus that forms endospores, lives in the soil, what would happen is it would when the animal would eat the endospores it would get into their system and kill them quite rapidly um, and kill them in such a fashion that you couldn't eat the the meat so you it was a complete loss of quite a bit of your herd when humans got anthrax it was cutaneous anthrax it generally arose from working with animals cattle such as cows goats sheep that were susceptible to anthrax and the endospores in large numbers uh, from infected cattle would enter into cuts and would form a lesion 
which would form eventually this depressed black scab. Usually it was a low-grade fever associated with this, and it would clear up and you'd get better. Now, with weaponized anthrax, uh, during the attack through the mail system in 2001, most about half the people got cutaneous anthrax. They had a cut on their hand, they had a paper cut while opening the envelope, and you would get this, and it was fairly mild. We do treat it with antibiotics, specifically Cipro, but about half of the people got pneumonia anthrax, and we'll talk about that in the respiratory chapter. But generally speaking, when we talk about anthrax, this is what we're talking about is the cutaneous form, which is fairly mild. Now, before 2001, interesting little side note, if you had a blood sample and you isolated large gram-positive rods, you generally considered it a contaminant, somebody had some dust on their skin that you didn't get rid of while you were taking the blood sample, and we would ignore it. Since the anthrax attack, we take gram-positive rods seriously when it's isolated from the blood because you never know when it's going to happen again. Gangrene, unlike anthrax, which is a bacillus, which is obligate aerobe, gangrene is caused by a gram-positive rod that forms endospores that is an obligate anaerobe, clostridium, usually clostridium perfringens. Now, if the endospores get into the deep tissue where there's lower oxygen tension, the endospores will germinate and start to grow within the tissue. Now, Clostridium perfringens produces several toxins that lead to destruction of the tissue. And you get, usually in this order, you get redness with swelling, followed by the air affected area turning black. The cure for this is to remove the affected tissue and treat with antibiotics. Now this has a tendency to show up in folks that have had a deep wound, a puncture. Sometimes it shows up from bullet wounds, especially historically. This showed up in soldiers that were shot and lay in the field for several hours waiting to be rescued. Soil bacteria, the clostridium, would get into the wound and then later cause gas gangrene. Now we call it gas gangrene because there's also gas produced by the organism, which is part of the swelling as well as the immune response. This also has a tendency to happen with folks who have limited mobility bed-bound patients, and also in diabetics. Diabetics, especially if they have neuropathy in their feet, can cut themselves and not know it, and therefore don't treat the wound and you develop gangrene. Cat scratch disease is an interesting disease, mainly because it's quite common, but most of us don't know about it. It's actually more common than Lyme disease, and anybody who is associated with cats is at risk for it. It's a quite a mild disease. Let's talk about how it gets circulated within its normal reservoir, which is the domesticated or feral cat. It, um, they say that 50% of feral and domesticated cats have a bacteremia of this gram-negative bacterium called Bartonella hesseli, and it is obligate aerobe and it lives in the red blood cells of the cat. See, there's a little pore so that they've got a little snorkel up to the blood system where it can get access to all sorts of oxygen and generally is a subclinical infection in cats. It gets passed from cat to cat, we think, through cat fleas. The flea bites the cat, blood, vessel, uh, blood cells get into the flea, replicate in the gut of the flea, pass out in the feces, and then when the cat scratches itself because of the itch of the flea bite, feces get in, in the claws and get it re-injected into the cat where it persists. Now it gets passed to humans when you get scratched by a cat. We don't know if we can get it from the cat fleas or from being bitten by a cat. You generally get a papule at the site of the infection. You get swelling of the lymph nodes, fever, 
malaise, you just don't feel good, and it's usually self-limiting and you get better on your own. In severe cases, we administer antibiotics. Keep this disease in mind when we talk about bubonic plague because at least in recent history we've thought that a patient had cat scratch disease which is the more common disease and it turns out they've got bubonic plague. Speaking of bubonic plague, you've all heard of this. Bubonic plague uh, moved across Europe during the 1300s. We think it spread from China from there to India and then came into the uh, Mediterranean on trading ships and devastated Europe. During the first initial epidemic caused panic, gee I can't imagine why, and changed history. In some places, it, in some villages it wiped up out up to three quarters of the population. We did have subsequent uh, epidemics and from Europe it spread to the United States to the eastern part of the United States. Now there were also epidemics happening in China and it spread to the western United States from China from trade with China and kind of met in the middle. We still have bubonic plague in the United States. This is where we generally see it. It has become endemic in the squirrel population, mainly ground squirrels, and that's where we're picking it up now. Now you'll see over in the Four Corners area is where we see most of the cases, but oh look right here in the Boise area we've had a few cases. In fact this year in 2012 we had a case in Western Oregon. Let's talk about the symptoms of bubonic plague and then we'll talk about this Oregon case. What happens is bubonic plague lives in mammals but it's passed from mammal to mammal by fleas. What would happen is rats, Rattus norwegianus, would have these gram-negative bacilli called Yersinia pestis causing a septicemia within their blood and fleas would bite the rats and the Yersinia pestis would get into the fleas and replicate within the fleas and they would replicate to the point where it would block their their gut. So even though they're trying to feed they couldn't get anything into their system. So they're hungry so they start biting repeatedly spreading the Yersinia. Well it would spread to humans when the rat fleas would jump to the human and the hungry flea starts biting away. Yersinia pestis gets into the human causes a septicemia as well as swelling of the lymph nodes. The swelling of the lymph nodes we call buboes. That's where you get the term bubonic plague. It can happen at the lymph nodes at the groin, in the armpit, and you have fever. And 50% of the folks that get bubonic plague die. That's without treatment of antibiotics. With treatment of antibiotics, we still have a fairly high mortality rate. It's something in the 20%, which is ridiculous when you consider modern medicine. Don't handle dead rodents because they're probably covered in fleas that are hungry. They're going to jump to you and pass this Yersinia pestis to you. Now there's two other forms of um, Yersinia pestis infection. There's pneumonic plague and septic plague. I'm going to leave you to read about that. Let's talk about the case in Oregon. There is a man that his cat he thought was choking on a rodent. So he was trying to help the cat, got scratched, got bit, went to the hospital, they treated him. He started getting swelling of his lymph nodes. They thought it was cat scratch fever, treated it as such. Turns out it was bubonic plague. Probably caught it from the rodent that the cat was trying to eat. He survived, but he was in the hospital for a whole lot longer. Over in Colorado there was a little girl also this year in 2012 who saw a dead rodent. She had been warned by her family not to touch dead rodents but she wanted to bury it. She took her coat off, flopped it over the, the rodent, dug a little hole, scooted it in without touching it, thought everything was fine. Well, fleas jumped from the dead rodent 
to her coat and bit her. At least that's what we think happened because she had little bite marks around on her abdomen and she ended up with bubonic plague. She's also okay, but don't go anywhere near dead rodents. Just let them decay in the open and save yourself from getting bubonic plague. Well, that's it for part one. Take a break, stretch, and come back and we'll talk about Lyme disease.